so setting up. All right, we uh, we are live. Um, let me close this down as uh, we get started here and make this bigger. Perfect. All right, um, we'll wait for a couple people to join us. Usually it'll just pop up here when people come in. Everybody will get a notice that says the mystery collection is live. And um, so, all right, we got a couple people joining in now. So we'll go ahead and get started. Um, this is a this is a, a a project I've wanted to do for a while, and I had Jake scheduled for earlier um, last year, and uh, everything just kind of fell apart. As as people that have been tuning in on this know, everything's just kind of kind of fell apart on me and fell apart on kind of the world. So I, I took a few months off of this, and and uh, but I'm glad Jake could, could work it out and come back. Um, I I, uh, I have a quote here, Jake, that I did not tell you I want to read. I did a little bit of research on your book, and then and I'm going to let you introduce yourself here in a second. And we'll talk, but I just I want to read this quote because as you can see behind me, I'm a little bit of a Hunter Thompson fan. And um, the New York Journal of Books says about your book, Gone of Midnight. Gone of Midnight, Gone at Midnight is not the typical true crime story. It represents an evolution of the genre with one infamous crime giving way to gonzo-like reflections, cultural criticisms, and a writing style that befits both book and blog. I think that's pretty rad. I, I, and you know, reading the book, I, I, I see it as well. I, I, I see that your, your writing style is very, uh, very unique for a true crime style, style book. So I just want to start off with, uh, with, with saying that uh, that would be, a, I think I'd wear that on a t-shirt if I were compared to, to Hunter S. Thompson. I think that would be something I would be pretty proud of, so. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I, I'm, I, I don't think I'm in that, in that league, but I mean, it's definitely like a, a huge compliment. I'm a huge fan of Hunter S. Thompson. And yeah, I actually like did consider this, like uh, I do consider myself wanting to kind of merge the, the true crime genre with, with gonzo style journalism. Um, because I mean, there, there is a lot of like first person reflection in true crime, but I think there's definitely, I think there's definitely room for, especially in a case like this, I think there's room for you know, kind of exploring new territory and whatnot. Well, having been, you know, and uh, people, my, my friends and people that are watching know I'm a, a huge Hunter Thompson fan. I, I, I got a chance to hang out with him a couple of times and I, and I met him several times. Wow. My first edition copy of Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas is signed to Paul, don't try this at home. <laughs> and, but, but I, I, you know, now that you say that, and now that we have this discussion, there is a lot of, of, of I don't want to say similarities, but a lot of the same vibe in reading Hell's Angels. You know, kind of the first person look at at something that is 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 not known to normal, you know, pop culture. It's it's on the the you know, the outskirts of pop culture and having having kind of embedded yourself in in the crime. So uh, we'll, we'll we'll get more to this. I don't want to get ahead of ahead of myself. I want to give you a chance to introduce yourselves. Uh, Jake Anderson is a a writer, a blogger, a researcher. Um, you've been featured in several magazines, and you just released your first book, um, Gone at Midnight. It's available on Amazon in Kindle, hardcover, and audiobook. I just checked. Uh, you also run a project called The Ghost Diaries. So I'll, I'll give you a few. Go ahead and kind of tell us a little bit about yourself, how you got from uh, from from here to there. Yeah, well, yeah, I mean, so I started uh, The Ghost Diaries like about eight years ago. It was originally just kind of like a, I've always been, you know, curious, interested in like the paranormal realm, uh, it ended up becoming kind of like a, uh, kind of just like a repository for just any kind of strange story I would find. Like, um, you know, I'm also like obsessed with space and cosmology and just uh, pretty much any mystery that's out there uh, that I can document. Um, so it kind of started like that. And then um, the Elisa Lamb case is just one of those stories that came, a came across my my lap that I started, you know, looking at, and um, the more I looked at it, uh, the more it just kind of clung on to me. And like, like a lot of people watching that surveillance video, which of course is, you know, infamous now. Like, I there was just something about it that, um, while it's not necessarily like a, you know, found footage horror type scare in terms of watching it, you know, she doesn't. Uh, get swooped up by some demon or um, you know you don't see her get killed there um, but there was something about it that was so mysterious to me and so 
Yeah, I started writing. What's so. scarier about that than found footage is the first thing you see when you see some paranormal found footage is, oh shit, that's fake. But this is surveillance video that came, you know, from the police and from, you know, and so there's, it's, it's. Right. Yeah. There's something particularly weird, not weird. There's something particularly scary about the raw surveillance footage from a crime that is unsolved. Like right. it, it really makes you want to insert yourself into that reality and try and look around and, 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 and go searching for what, what the answer is. And, you know, with that. You didn't know she was being filmed. And you know, nowadays, I mean, granted, this was only what eight years ago. And um, now you got to assume everything you do is being filmed. She had no idea she, you know, that that wasn't why she was doing what she was doing. She she didn't need to get filmed. Right. Yeah. And and you know, it, it's you just want to know so badly, like what, who was there? Someone out there in the hallway? Was there maybe someone in the hotel? And I know we're going to get into these questions, but um, yeah, that's so that that drew me in, and then. I found, you know, as I looked into the case more, I found out that she, you know, had, uh, you know, struggles with with mental illness, uh, particularly depression and bipolar disorder. Uh, and I, I've always had a struggle with depression myself. And uh, my my aunt had bipolar disorder, and and I've had a few friends that have, you know, almost lost their lives to it. My aunt did lose her life to it. So I, I was very interested in the fact that Elisa had so vigorously documented um, in first person her struggle with it. I thought it was like incredibly brave. And so the combination of this already mysterious case that so little is known about, um, and then all of a sudden we get this inside look into her brain from, from her was just so incredible to me um, that that's when I started thinking about it more as a long form project. And then that's around the time we, we launched the Kickstarter for it uh, to try and make a documentary, which we're still working on and we'll, I'll get into that in, in a minute. But, and uh, you know, I didn't intend or I didn't know at the time when I first started writing this uh, that I was gonna end up changing my opinion essentially on, on what happened. Uh, I didn't know that I was gonna start stumbling upon little new pieces of evidence that that made me question uh, the criminal investigation of it so that was just like kind of a, a third uh, a third turn a third twist to my my involvement in this case was all of a sudden I'm not sure whether I've just maybe I just got too involved in it maybe I'm too emotionally connected to it and I'm reading into things that I shouldn't be or uh, I kind of feel like there, you know, as a person who has struggled with those issues myself, there's nothing worse than I can imagine than um, being killed by someone and then having it blamed on my, you know, a mental illness. You know, that seems just like a, a horrible final irony and tragedy to this. So that's that's kind of like the 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 blathering uh, history of like how I how I started working on this case. Well, before we uh, we jump head first into the uh, the Elisa Lamb story, I want to talk about a little bit more about ghost diaries and your 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 fascination with the paranormal. As best. that is the the kind of the the ilk that follows the show and the the, the folks that listen, sure, yeah, yeah, see my show. Um, I always ask uh, these these questions of people when they come on is you know about your personal experiences in the paranormal. Have you know I'm I'm a big UFO guy. I've never I've never had any any experience. I've never had any 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 you know, witnessings or abductions or anything, but I, I, I really kind of wish it would happen. This is uh, a great, this is a great time to be into UFOs, <laughs> as I'm sure you know. Like, yes, yes, yes. Well, yeah, stuff's getting released every, every day. And, and it's, it's, uh, um, so what are so so what are, uh, do you have any personal experiences or stories or what is scary to someone who's researched, you know, the, the paranormal as much as you have? What are some of your, uh, your, 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 your boxes that you tick when you, when you talk about the paranormal? So I always went into it with a, a skeptical mind because I'm, I'm a science nerd and um, I, 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 so I go into it with a skeptical mind, meaning it takes a lot for me to be like, holy crap, that this is, this is real. Um, having said that, um, I do have, I have kind of over the years, especially since staying at the Cecil Hotel a couple of times, uh, redefine, kind of come up with my own definition of like what, what I consider paranormal activity to be and and uh, I'll get into that gradually but yeah I mean 
when I look at stuff like that, um, I, you know, my personal experience with it, there's probably been a, a couple different times where I thought maybe something um, different was going on. Um, and I, I, I talk about, uh, I talk about one of these in the book, but uh, the one I talk about in the book is when I went to Santa Cruz uh, for undergraduate college. And my freshman year, me and my buddy, Jared, we found out that uh, a guy who lived at our college, Porter College, um, about five years earlier, he had uh, wrapped himself in an American flag on the fourth floor balcony and shot himself with a shotgun wow. and landed down in the quad. And um, I, as a person with a morbid mind, morbid curiosity, I started asking around and I, I found out that the guy who worked in the cafeteria had been friends with him. And so I asked him about it and he was very tight lipped about it. Um, and I respected that, you know, I'm not gonna like, I don't like grilling people about dif difficult subjects, but it, it just seemed like those, no one could really figure out why it had happened or, um, or you know, w whether psychedelics were involved, which happens a lot at Santa Cruz, but, um, you know, and so one day kind of in the, in the midst of me being kind of obsessed with this, I, I was in the quad and I noticed that there was this kind of figure circling the, the quad and it was the only figure there. Um, and at one point it kind of stopped and started just stood there staring up at, at, the, at one of the balconies. And I only kind of realized later, wow, that, that's really strange. Usually the quad is full of people and there was just this one figure. And then I, I looked it up and yeah, the, 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 the balcony that the figure had been staring at was indeed the same balcony that that this guy had, had killed himself on could just be a coincidence, easily could just be a coincidence, but it, it left me with a very haunting feeling. And then, uh, you know, another experience I had was just going to this uh, kind of like haunted park in Los Angeles and me and a buddy on our way out, we had been searching for ghosts, you know, kind of stupid 20 something hijinks. And it looked like this creature was, was coming out of the sewer and it was so pal so palpably real like that it, it looked like a small child like it basically looked like a small child that was walking from the sewer towards us and it was so real to me that that i you know was actually saying like it's okay it's okay what's wrong because i was so convinced that this was a, a sentient creature it turns out it was <laughs> uh just a a, a skunk with and its its tail was what was making it look like there was uh, the movements that's what was making the movements look weird is it was that i wasn't seeing the front part of the body i was just seeing this tail moving towards me uh my my buddy was just like dude that, that thing shape-shifted <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah that, that was a shape-shifter and like it was extremely weird but and you know and this this gets into stuff i ended up researching for the book is you know, as humans, I, I feel like we're naturally drawn to try and read patterns in, in the chaos around us. Um, evolutionarily speaking, that, that's the only way we survived was, was finding uh, structure uh, in, in a chaotic surroundings. So I feel like that's, uh, I feel like that's writ into the way we just perceive the world. And um, we're, we're looking for, you know, we see faces in static, we, we hear voices in, in static. We, we need that. Um, well, and as a, as a performing magician, um, and, uh, you know, uh, uh, we, we take advantage of that. I mean, that, that's something that we, you know, that, that performing magicians take advantage of is the, the as, as we get older, we, we fill in blanks with, with, with past experiences and, you know, you, you know what you're looking for. So you see what you're, what you're looking for. Right. And that's one of the, and we've ta I've talked about this on, on this show before with, with uh, uh, paranormal researchers and some skeptics about how you know you it's the the you you know what you're going you you you're going into something looking for a spirit of a little girl that was abandoned by her parents and guess what you're going to see a little girl that was abandoned by her parents you know so right. with that, so what is the uh, what is the 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 future of the and then we're going to get we're going to jump head first in what is the future of the um, uh, ghost stars what where you said you're going to revamp that is it going to be uh, what, what is what is coming up for the ghost diaries? You yeah, I, basically, I'm I'm gonna look. I'm gonna work on. I'm transitioning it into more of a true crime uh, okay. 
destination. Now, I, I still will have, I mean, I have a ton of paranormal articles I've written about where I talk about how I think it's, you know, these are information patterns, um, basically residual energy from the past that we're, that we're seeing and interpreting. So I, I'm not uh, turning my back on that, on parapsychological stuff, but I, I do kind of want to start uh, really making it a, a place where uh, cold case investigators can, can uh, share, you know, share information and just delve into cases like that. So yeah, I mean, it, that, that's essentially what I'm going to be doing. I mean, it's, it's already been kind of like that, but so what are the cases that uh, that's the unsolved and, and, and guys we have about looks like we have about two dozen viewers right now if you guys have any questions i've got the monitor up here so pop in with any questions for jake um what are some of the cases that are still out there that that, that are are keeping you up at night what are some of the ones that you you want to tackle well the one i'm working on right now extra hard i, I might be writing something about it uh is the west mesa serial killer this was uh albuquerque's Really, Albuquerque's first serial killer, but um, not, it's it's not that popular of a case because all of all of the victims were, you know, kind of you know marginalized sex workers, and so the police didn't take it seriously. And um, you know, there's like 14 or 15 victims, like in in, in any other demographic of, of people where there were 15 victims, uh, the police would have would have they wouldn't have rested until they. Had figured it out, and um, yeah, this is another example of a, a city with uh, pretty corrupt, uh, pretty corrupt uh, police officers. Not all of them, um, obviously, but some of the ones who were working back then, they were, uh, you know, abusing sex workers, uh, scaring them. Some of the sex workers believe that the, the police were actually involved in some of the murders. That's, that's, you know, hearsay. I don't have direct evidence of that, but it is a statistic I've been looking at, which surprised the heck out of me, which is that uh, sex workers are, are more likely to be abused by a police officer than by a John, you know? Um, and that's, I, I think, something we need to look at as a society. But so yeah, the West Mesa case is, is one that I'm uh, working on. Uh, there's a case called the Jameson, Jameson family case down in Oklahoma, which is eerily similar actually to the Elisa Lamb case uh, in terms of there being a weird surveillance video that surfaced right before they died. And it's just utterly confounding uh, disappearance. And I've been trying desperately to get in touch with the family. I've talked to a couple of the extended family members, uh, but it's, it's been just almost impossible to get in touch with the immediate family. And uh, I, I, I just really, if you look into the, I have an article on, on the ghost diaries about the Jameson family mystery. And it, it, it's a whopper. I, I, I think it's gonna be, you know, it's already got a lot of people interested in it, but I, th I think it could be the next obsessive craze when more people realize how uh, utterly confounding it is. But yeah, there's all kinds of cases, man. We live I'll in a- link, I'll post a link tonight on the mystery collection page to the ghost diaries so you guys can check these out. I'll post the link to it. So, all right. So let's let's uh, let's d jump into Lisa Lamb. The first question I have for you is is um, why why is her story important? If if it if it weren't for that video, would the oh we have a uh, I have a viewer from uh, Oklahoma, Jennifer Norman says she can confirm that story. She knows she knows awesome. about that. So Jennifer, if you have any insight to the family, please reach out to Jake. That would be that would be great. Um, why is why is Lisa Lamb's story important? Why why? Why talk about Elisa? I mean, what is what is the big picture? What is the story of Elisa Lamb? Other than the, I mean, obviously the mystery. There's but there's a million mysteries. What? Why is Lisa Lamb important? Well, I I mentioned I think the main one uh, before when we were talking about mental illness. I think uh, this is a, a case that has a unique uh, unique ability to unite people. Um, a lot of people with depression and bipolar have found a kind of uh, unlikely community around this case, which is, you know, the stigmatization of mental illness. And there's all kinds of different um, viewpoints as to many, many viewpoints about whether this was purely mental illness or whether, uh, you know, a lot of women with mental illness become targets for sexual assault um, because of that. Um, so it could be a combination of things. Um, and so I think, you know, destigmatizing mental illness is definitely a, a huge reason for me. 
I think also um, the, the history of the Cecil Hotel, which has uh, received landmark status, which further kind of uh, inoculates it against investigations. Um, in, in researching this, I, I've discovered uh, there, there's been many, many uh, assaults uh, against women in that building. Um, security guards that uh, are very predatory. Um, and so I think, I think there needs to be, uh, I mean, I think there should has to be like a major investigation into the history of that hotel and the history of, of whether there is any kind of police involvement in, you know, uh, is it, was it a safe house at some point? What, where, you know, was this a place where police could launder dirty work? I mean, there's just so many strange things going on in this building. So I think that's another reason this case is important. Um, well, let's, let's jump into the, let's jump into the Cecil. Let's talk about the Cecil, the, uh, or Cecil Hotel. It um, was built in the mid twenties. Is that right? Mid 28, 27. Yeah. Around then. Yeah. And it was at the time it was, it was pretty fancy. I mean, it was, a, it was a higher end place. Um, and as time, you know, as LA built and grew, it became a, a it was on Skid Row. It's on the, uh, the infamous Skid Row and people quit going because it was the neighborhood around it started to deteriorate and there, uh, um, you know, there's, there's, there's three big ones, three big stories before the Lisa Lamb story. One of two of them are, are, I think confirmed. And one of them is kind of a, uh, a maybe, but uh, the most famous is uh, Richard Ramirez, the night stalker. He was a resident of the, of the hotel. And the story goes, he would take his clothes off and dump them in the dumpster before he went back into the building. And, and the, he did this continuously. Is that is, uh, and it's also the hotel from American horror story. That was, it was kind of, uh, modeled after that and then the the one that is is that i think is the creepiest is the uh jack Un unterwinger yeah um this guy he was in jail in austria correct for murder uh -huh. yeah and and he wrote poems and novels and plays from jail and consider and they considered him such a a talented person they, they let him out right and then he came to the united states and started killing killing people under yeah. the guise of doing research correct yeah, it's the Unterweger case is unbelievable. I mean, I know that the, the Night Stalker always overshadows of other cases, but the uh, Unterweger was, I mean, it's probably the only serial killer in history that was able to essentially exponentially increase his killing spree by using literature, by like using his own literature. He basically tricked, tricked the entire, uh, uh, intellectual literary community in Austria to convince them that he was a case of uh, rehabilitation, uh, that, uh, that his first killing was due to like the psychological distress of his mother, um, you, know, uh, you know, family trauma and whatnot. And then, yeah, he was released and, and, and went to Los Angeles and stayed at the Cecil Hotel. And yeah, did ride alongs with the cops and he used that to case up case sex workers and figure out, you know, where he could, you know, find them and whatnot. And then he would, uh, he, he fashioned this incredibly meticulous kind of noose using bras. Uh, that's, how they, that's how they put everything together is he had a, a very special knot, correct? A very special knot that allowed him to um, really meticulously have control over how much they could breathe. I mean, it's a, this guy was just sadistic to the point of, of uh, just his horrifying sadistic uh, behavior. And so, yeah, that was that was a second serial killer. And apparently when he showed up, he found out that Ramirez had been there before and he thought that was cool. Um, so he was, I don't know, I don't want to call it a copycat, but, but yeah, the Ramirez, that one kind of freaks me out a little bit because uh, he lived on the 14th floor. He, so he lived on the same floor where Elisa's surveillance footage was, was captured, which is kind of, I mean, if you're into the paranormal stuff, to me, right. that, that is a very haunting um, synchronicity there. Um, now, we know yeah. what happened to Richard Ramirez. He died of, I think, natural causes in jail, right? Uh, who knows what happened, but the real happened. But what happened to Jack, to Jack Unterweger? What I don't. I, what's the end of that story? Yeah, after he was convicted, right. after he was con finally convicted, uh, he hung himself using the same kind of tourniquet that that he used to kill his victims. It was, as as one reporter put it, it was his finest murder. 
um, killing himself. He used like uh, the elastic from his jogging pants or something. Um, and yeah, I mean, that, 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 there's an incredible book on him uh, called Entering in Hades. If you guys want to know more about uh, the Jack Underbegger case, it's really incredible. But I mean, this, as far as the Cecil Hotel, I mean, that's just, that's, that was just one of the later chapters from the 80s and 90s. Before that, there, there were dozens, literally dozens and dozens of suicides, um, murders, um, the, the, the pigeon lady, or uh, uh, Osga, I can't, uh, Dorothy Osga, I think was her name. The, the locals called her the pigeon lady. She was uh, you know, brutally uh, raped and murdered in her room at the Cecil Hotel. There was a woman there that, that gave, uh, gave birth in, in her sleep while she was at the Cecil Hotel and, and dropped her child out of the window at the Cecil Hotel. Well, at the time they called it the Suicide Hotel, correct? Because of the, the, they had a rash of suicides and it became known locally as the Suicide Hotel. Right, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's so it's, it, this is a, there's a long history of strange things going, going on there. And um, <laughs> So, which is why I, I was shocked at the at near the end of researching for my book, I discovered that you know they're renovating the hotel, which is also what made it difficult for for me and my production crew to get access uh, to the hotel. Though we were able to get some, um, but they're 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 building a rooftop bar and pool there. That's this latest story. I right. mean. Not only is it in bad taste, obviously, but I, it seems like a recipe for an, another disaster happening. Well, yeah, and I read they're trying to make it into a multi-use building where it's going to have apartments, it's going to have office buildings, and then retail as well. So right. It's uh, just part of the the endless gentrification going on in in any downtown. But down, but uh, you know, there there's been about half a dozen owners that have cycled through trying to figure out how to make money off of the Cecil Hotel, and they've all failed. And uh, uh, who knows whether uh, there's something haunted in that building. I went there twice and it, it, it's, there's something wrong there. I don't know what it is. You can call it whatever you want. But when I stayed there, it was, it was uh, uh, terrifying. I could barely sleep and I was not, you know, I was not inebriated or anything like that. I just, I, the whole night I, I felt like someone was watching me um, I felt I woke up thinking someone was in the building trying to kill me. Wow. Um, I ended up at the door looking out of the eye hole several times because I kept thinking someone was out there. It was, it, it's just a cursed place. And, uh, yeah. Well, the one that is not uh, this, the Cecil Hotel story that is not, um, I, I can't find any definite proof. And I have to ask because my friend, my friend Chelsea's out there watching and she does, she does a show on this is Elizabeth Short. Is there any is there any proof that Elizabeth Short spent time there? Yeah, so there, there's a couple of local historians that have uh, debate this. Um, th there, there's some. I guess there was some kind of re uh, report, you know, uh, hearsay report, third hand evidence of that that she went to the bar at the Cecil Hotel the night the night that she the Black Dahlia the night that she was brutally killed. But that can't really be confirmed. But you know, regardless, that hotel is only blocks from where her body was found, and we know that she she did like to go there at times. So whether she was actually there the night she was killed or not, um, you know, Cecil Hotel is still right. You know, you probably would have been able to see that placard for the Cecil Hotel in the distance from where Elizabeth Short's body was found. And, and there's some weird connections, uh, synchronicities, I guess I should say, between the Black Dahlia and Elisa Lamb. Um, the, the, there's a esoteric blog documents them and I, I put them in the, in the book, but there's just a lot of like just incredibly stunning parallels between the two of them as individuals, their traveling habits. Um, so that's if 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 you like the black black dahlia lore um, and mythology, it, it definitely connects up to this case. Well, that's a uh, oh, I got a little warning here that that pops up for everybody. Let me shut this down here. Um, sorry. Um, 
So that brings us to to uh, to to Elisa. Let's talk a little bit about how how Elisa ended up at the hotel. She uh, she's Canadian. She was not American citizen. She was Canadian of she was Cambo Cambodian. Her family came. Uh -huh. Uh, Chinese Canadian. Yeah. Oh, okay, okay. So tell us a little bit about who who was Lisa Lam and how did she end up at the at the hotel? So I mean, I I created a portrait of her based upon her own writings. Um, I was able to talk to a, a couple of her friends, but yeah, she blogged the whole journey. I mean, she had a, a, a pretty much an everyday entry, correct? Yeah, up and well, up unfortunately, up until the last couple of days, which. Uh, is frustrating because it, it, it limits how much we can know about her final movements. Although I, I'll get back to this later, there was someone who tracked the metadata of her posts on Tumblr. And um, you, can, you can basically study someone's IP uh, address and what device they use based on the metadata. So someone attempted to create kind of like a timestamp map of, of her movements in the last couple of days. Anyway, I'll get back to that later. But, um, you know, as a person, you know, like, I mean, in many ways, Elisa was, uh, you know, just like, you know, a you know, normal 21 year old, she, she had, uh, you know, she was, you know, hoping to find love. She was hoping to find connection. And, you know, she was trying to figure out what she wanted to do in life. Um, she was really interested in blogging. She wrote a lot. She read a lot. Thought she was really interested in fashion, um, and uh, she was a good, good writer and um, a good person. She was interested in activism and stuff like that. She was very uh, honest, like in her writings. She was just uh, brutally honest about herself um, and and her struggles with uh, depression and bipolar, which which kind of became like a foreboding cloud that just kind of seemed to enter her life around when she was 20 and just slowly uh, uh, limited her more and more, slowly incapacitated her, um, where she would write these long posts in all caps. And these are essentially, if you know anything about bipolar disorder, she was having a, a manic episode or probably a hypomanic episode because hypomanic episodes are a little easier to contain. Um, but she write these long hypomanic rants about how she, you know, everything was amazing and everything made sense to her and she was just bursting with excitement. And then the next post would, would be like one sentence saying, uh, well, I, I, I've been in bed sleeping for the last couple of days. You know, so she would crash after this you know, hypomanic episode, uh, and she she took tried taking some medications for it. She she talked about how she went to a doctors and I think she she was on you know medications for you know mood stabilizers and stuff like that. Of course, she she went off most of these uh, by the time she got to the Cecil. There was only one med still in her system, and that was not her mood stabilizer. So it seemed like uh, she was looking for, you know, meaning in her life, like so many people are at 21 and even later. And so she took this trip, um, her, her West Coast tour. And um, in retrospect, it's probably ill-advised for her to have gone alone, but she did. And she was very excited about this trip. Uh, and, you know, why she stopped in LA, particularly the Cecil Hotel is a bit of a mystery. Um, originally she just went to San Diego, um, and she lost a cell phone there. And when she gets to LA, we don't know why she stopped there, but, um, at some point she, she, she bought some presents for her family at the last bookstore. And, uh, I think that was really the last time she was seen out in public. And then the posts, her posts kind of stop, um, and her, one of her last posts was, you know, was talking about how the Cecil Hotel building reminded her of something from like the Great Gatsby, which she, she really was into the Great Gatsby. Um, so, you know, as, her as a person, I, I would say she's just a, a really awesome person, kind of person I, I want to be friends with. Uh, uh, I like emotionally intelligent people. I like honest people. Um, and I think that's a good way to deal with, with, with your problems is just to be honest with, with people so that, so that they can help you, um, which is 
I think what she needed more than anything was friends who understood mental illness. Um, and, you know, the last 48 hours are pretty mysterious. Uh, but um, as far as her as a person, I would say, uh, I don't think she was, you know, uh, you know, it's very easy to, to say, um, oh, well, she just, you know, people will use words like crazy, you know, she went, she just went crazy. I mean, people don't understand mental illness and they don't understand that you can be having a, a, a hypomanic episode or I think she was having a mixed episode during that surveillance uh, tape. A mixed episode is when you're kind of experiencing hypomanic symptoms and also like depressive kind of paranoid, um, some delusional, sometimes you can have delusional thoughts. I don't particularly think her behavior in the surveillance footage is all of that peculiar. I know some of the movements where she's doing things like that, um, but th that's, that's uh, psychomotor agitation. So that's a symptom of, of bipolar. But you know, if you, if you randomly like showed me surveillance footage of me alone standing anywhere, I might be doing, I'd probably be look more bizarre. Like, People do weird things when they're alone. It doesn't mean anything. And as we mentioned, they don't know they're being recorded. Right, yeah. Yeah, and, and we've had, I know I'm kind of deviating from the original question here, but, but the, you know, t I, I interviewed two different body language analysts to, who looked at, that, uh, looked at that surveillance video and uh, both of them basically were not able to conclude whether, she, they, they say that, her mood is changing, like she's scared in parts, uh, particularly the beginning, you know, and she kind of hides in the corner. And then she's also, uh, they also say she's being playful or that they're, that she's other parts, she's like happy and excited. So they're unable to conclude exactly what's going on, but uh, you know, the thought is maybe there was someone in the building who was courting her or somewhere in the buildings, maybe someone she had a crush on or just, you know, someone, could it have been a security guard? Um, could it have been the person who ultimately let her onto the roof? Uh, which we'll, we'll get back to because- We're talking about the security guard for sure. There's a big mystery about how she could have gotten on that roof and why she would have gone up to the roof. Well, uh, in, in the, you know, to, to talk a little bit more about the mental illness and the, and the meds, um, in, in the last year, I've, I've uh, my, my counselor and my, uh, my general physician, I, I've, I've started taking SSRIs and um, they, you know, they're, they're kind of a, a coverall, but I, I do know the research I've done on them is the, um, you don't just stop taking them, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it, it can be more dangerous for you just one day to stop taking them than it is to, uh, to, oh, to, to wean off and that's Absolutely. And, and I appreciate you, your, your honesty in talking about that. I, I've taken SSRIs most of my adult life. I've probably tried. I mean, honestly, there's probably like a, a framed photograph of myself like in, in pharmaceutical corporate boardrooms because I've, I've tried so many of their meds. And because um, it takes a while to find one that, that, that works for you, that, that blends with you. So I, oh, I, I went through a couple and the first one, um, it, it caused nothing but dread. Right. I, mean, I, I was convinced I had every, every, uh, I mean, I it was really bad. It was really bad. And, uh, I thought they finally, you know, tried some out and, and I'm on a good one and, uh, and I won't, I won't you know, plug any specific, but it's, uh, um, I, it is serious. And, and, you know, as starting, starting this adventure on, on, um, these kind of meds at 45 years old, uh, makes me think that, that maybe, you know, we're finally starting to take it serious. Had I, had I been, uh, had I been looked at or evaluated, in maybe my twenties, I, I, you know, I don't, I don't know what, what could have been different or what would have been different, but I, I think, you know, I, I, and this is one of the things I really got out of your book is that it's, it's, you're taking a look at, at a kind of a societal problem through, through a small, a, a very small, you know, piece. And it's, it's, it's kind of like the Joker when the movie, the Joker came out. I mean, it sure it was a comic book movie, but I really think it was kind of a, uh, an examination of the way we treat mental illness, you know, and, and how we, it, we, we as a government and we as a society treat mental illness. So I, I did appreciate that aspect of your book. And I, um, I, I do appreciate that aspect on Elisa because you're right. 
the, 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 the general consensus is, oh, she went crazy and, and did this and did this, but she, uh, I mean, there were some, there's some underlying facts that, that people don't, uh, don't really understand. Uh, we have a comment from, um, uh, a friend, uh, in, in, Chi in Wyoming that says as a physician, this is all very accurate. Uh, I wonder if her coming off her beds contributed to a lot of behavior seen. So, yeah. Well, and, and this person's analysis is, is, you know, obviously far more, you know, uh, professional than mine, but, uh, having, gone on and come off of, of a lot of SSRIs, the, anyone who, who's done it multiple times knows that the, 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 the weirdest parts of it are the first two weeks going on and the first two weeks coming off because your neurotransmitters are just kind of going all over the place trying to adapt to the medication. And uh, also with, with bipolar, especially uh, a lot of physicians um, say that you should not just be on an antidepressant, that you need to be also on a mood stabilizer. Um, and so they, they, they say it's, it's dangerous. You can have more manic episodes or mixed episodes if you're just taking an antidepressant. And that's what was going on. She had, uh, uh, what was, it wasn't, uh, Wellbutrin was one of the meds she was taking uh, I can't remember if that was, I think that was the one that she still had, uh, you know, half-life in her system, but all of the other ones, the mood stabilizer and the one, uh, Lamotrigine, uh, that's specifically for bipolar, were no longer in her system. And so I think that that, um, it, it doesn't mean there weren't other things going on. And in fact, in the book, I talk about how, what if all three things are going on? What, what, what if she was having a, a, a mixed episode and there was someone following her and there's a, you know weird energy left over at the Cecil Hotel, all creating like a perfect storm on, the, on, on that floor that night and ultimately you know, what, whatever drove her to the roof. But uh, one, more, one more thing about the meds and then we'll, we'll kind of move on to um, getting a little bit more into her stay at the, at the hotel. Um, did she, do you know, is there any ind indication on why she quit? Did she run out or did she just decide to quit? Yeah, she doesn't really, I, I, I don't think she directly says that. And there's no, there, there's no specific post where she's like, all right, I'm quitting my meds today. Um, she, she talks about how uh, she doesn't like the, the Canadian healthcare system. She calls it like a, a triage system where basically they don't, take your mental illness seriously unless you actually try to commit suicide. Um, so I, and I, she didn't like her doctor, whoever her doctor was, she felt like wasn't taking her seriously or wasn't, wasn't legitimizing her, her mental illness. Um, I, I think with a lot of people, I think, I mean, with myself included, this happened to me once where you get to a point where um, you, you start to feel like you're not being your true self or you start to feel like you're you're clouded or that you're not as creative anymore like this these are all reasons why a lot of a lot of people will go off their meds um you know a lot of people with with schizophrenia will you know once they get their condition stabilized they'll be like oh well i don't need these anymore i can i'm, I'm fine now i can go off of these and i think that happens with all of the different meds and again part of the reason for that is it's so stigmatized in our, in our society, there, there's, there's just this idea that you shouldn't need, you know, meds or drugs. Meanwhile, the people that are telling that to you are drinking Red Bulls and, and getting drunk and, you know, God knows all the other chemicals we put into our body all the time. Um, so it, it's sad to me that, that people um, go off their meds and I've done it myself, you know, go off their meds because they think like, uh, you know, they need to, they need to be a certain kind of person, you know? Well, and that was one of the concerns I had. And I, and I, this is actually the first time I've ever talked about it with, with, you know, just people that aren't, aren't in my close circle. But when I, uh, when I first started, um, my big concern was I'm, I, you know, I'm a performer. I'm, I, I pride myself on being witty. I pride myself on being quick and witty and very, very sharp. And that was my huge concern to both my my uh, psychologist counselor, counselor and my general physician is that I really am afraid that it's going to dull the, dull the sharpness. And so I, I really, I really, I mean, 
I, I kind of refused to do it. I really was hesitant to do it. And finally, I just, some things happened in my personal life that I just, I just knew that I needed, I needed uh, to, to, uh, something to level me out so I could work on some things. Right. And I will tell you, as, as uh, I, I know the story, because I've heard the stories about where people feel that they've, they've deadened their senses and they're not the person. I will, I will, I, my personal experience has been the exact opposite. I, I have kind of become, I believe I've become kind of more, the more true person that I, that I, that I am. And I think I've, I've got rid of, for lack of a better term, I've got rid of a lot of bullshit and, yeah. and I've kind of, you know, cleared the table a little bit of some garbage. And, um, I really am feeling, feeling sharper and smarter and more optimistic. And so, so I do think that, um, that, that I wish I would have taken a, a serious look at this earlier in my life. I really wish I would have. And so that's, if anybody gets anything out of, out of any if, if positive about anything I ever say is mental health is real. And, and especially for men, as you know, it's, it's kind of a, there's a stigma attached to mental, to men talking about mental health. Right. So and this is not at all where I planned on going with this today, but I'm glad we did. And, and uh, I, I think that that's, uh, I, I appreciate you sharing your personal experiences as well. Yeah, no, I appreciate you focusing on that. And I'm, I'm down to stay on as long as you want to, to make sure we, we delve into the other yeah. things things as well but yeah i think it's i think it's super important to talk about this so but if anybody has any questions i mean we're 45 minutes in and i'm only on card number three of eight so so i'll try to speed through these so i don't keep you all day but uh if anybody has any questions pipe in i i this has been uh this has been way more more uh, uh way broader than i thought it was gonna be it's been great so so but elisa let's let's talk a little bit about elisa she when she checks into the hotel she did, she was not alone, right? She checked into a, uh, like a hostel style environment where she shared a room with some other, some other girls, correct? Yeah. Yeah. She, she and, they were strangers. Yeah. And we, we don't know a whole lot of details about that, but we do know that the, the, basically the only reason we know this is because the manager ultimately would confirm that to police that she was living in, uh, it, when she checked in, she checked in with two, two other, uh, women are, uh, yeah, and they were so they were sharing a room um, on the on the fifth floor, and uh, all we know about that is that at some point, the these roommates uh, complained about her behavior and requested um, that she be moved, and so she was moved to her own separate room, and we don't know anything about these women. Uh, I mean, we I don't know why. Maybe they were interviewed, and the police just didn't want to release any information about that. That's 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 a whole card on its own coming up. Is the is the police? So yeah, and the, uh, yeah, the police. I mean, that, yeah. But uh, as far as these women, I don't know more about it. I mean, I, I hope that you know, there's this new series on coming coming out soon about the case on Netflix. Uh, I, I wish it were. I wish it were my series, but. It's not, but you know, I think they were able to. Hopefully, they they were able to uh, get some answers to some of these questions uh, as far as what 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 happened. Um, I, I I doubt that they're going to have an answer to like what ultimately happened, but it would be it would be interesting to know what kind of be, what kind of behavior they were talking about, and you know. But yeah, she, but anyway, she showed up, she showed up with uh, two women. I don't know if she met them on a, on a bus coming from San Diego to LA or, or why she was with them. Um, but she ultimately was moved to her own room and that's, that's what we know. Okay. So she, they move her to her own room and um, she's, how, how many days is she at the hotel? She's at the hotel for, for, before she moves, she's there for two days with the roommates, or is it? Yeah, I think it was about. Uh, it's been a while since I've looked specifically at the timeline, but she she was there for about. I think she was about two days with with the housemates or with the roommates. When they move her, and is it the next day she's in the elevator? Yeah, I, I'm pretty sure it's the next day. Yeah, and you know, yeah. So she, you know, went to uh, that. The main information we have on that day that last day is that she went to the last bookstore and there was a, originally there was one uh, witness who talked to her there. It was the uh, manager of the store, uh, Amy Price. No, not Amy, Amy Price. Um, I can't remember her name, but manager of the last bookstore. And um, she, she uh, basically 
told police or told news that, she, you know, Lisa was acting totally nice and fine and there was nothing wrong. Um, I, I found another witness who had been at the store um, who, who talked to her there, who had a different interpret or different experience. He was saying that she seemed really worked up, um, really jittery. Um, I mean, he just straight out said that she seemed like she was having some kind of, you know, psychological issue, that she was being way too forward. And his impression that he took away was that she, she was a danger to herself, the way she was acting. Um, so that, you know, kind of ties in a little bit with the idea that she was maybe having a mixed episode uh, coming off of her meds and whatnot. Um, it also kind of seems like it would make her susceptible to a, a, a predator, which is exactly what this guy said, which is that he, he, was, he was worried about her by, based on how she was acting that, uh, you know, so, and this person said the police never interviewed him about this. The police also, I, I spoke to the, uh, the chief psychologist uh, at the LAPD, and he said that the detectives never talked to him or his, his team about bipolar disorder. So that's odd to me that they're, they're basically saying that someone ended up in a water tank because of bipolar disorder but they're not gonna talk to the in-house psychiatric team about, uh, you know, would someone on having a bipolar episode or a manic episode, would they do something like that? And, you know, there's all kinds of people out there with, with their own experiences. Some say, absolutely, I could do something like that, climb into a water tank. Um, well, I'll real quick and to take a step back along those notes as well. Yeah. Uh, Jennifer from Oklahoma says, on an aside, throw in the fact that she was female. We're often told that we're being emotional and that we're fine. This adds an extra issue of mental health issues. Um, and there's a totally different stigma attached to both genders. You know, so if one, if the woman manager says she was fine and the man says she was not, I mean, it, you know, I mean, that, that adds a little bit of uh, uh, a... Yeah take to it you know i mean good, good if, point, if, actually i hadn't i hadn't thought about that but yeah you're right that could be um that there could be uh, some gender bias in that uh absolutely it's so interesting because at this point she's not she's not posting anymore to social media correct and yeah I, when she it, her last post was before she is asked to change rooms right so she yeah. doesn't do anything about that but now, it, now correct me if this is wrong this is one of those things that i've seen pop up in other places and i haven't that she does make some sort of post about a weird guy or a weird feeling or something in the lobby is that not true or is that i haven't read her post that's the that's my my fault but does she, she post, well you know, she, she she posted about some weird guys that were uh creeping on her but but i think that i, I my I think that was in San Diego. Uh, if you, if I looking closer at that, yeah, because uh, yeah, she posts about how some guys were coming onto her strong, and but looking closer at that at the timeline of it, I believe that was in San Diego. Uh, however, there is we do know that there is additional surveillance tape that the police haven't released, but confirm exists that she did at one point enter the Cecil Hotel with two men, and. Uh, they were holding something like a box or something and give it to her and then they leave. And I, I don't, that box could have just been food leftovers or something like that. But we, we don't know anything more about who these, who these guys were. The police haven't said anything about it. Okay. So, so let's, let's, uh, Elisa gets on the 14th floor and she opens the elevator and she, she gets in the elevator. Let's start with this. And I, I, uh, I am a tech idiot or I would show the video right now, but I've posted it on my Facebook page and I'm hoping that everybody watching has seen the video. Uh, it's a, it's, if you, if you haven't, I'll, it's on my Facebook page, but so she gets on the elevator close to, I mean, it's late in the evening, the 14th floor, she gets on the elevator. What, what? Uh, it's around midnight. Okay. So, yeah. so she gets on the elevator. The first thing she does is kind of crunch down and hit all the buttons going down. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. She, she, she presses a bunch of the buttons and, and you know, one of, well, she, she, one of the first movements she does is she kind of uh, 
like, yeah, she presses the buttons and then she kind of like leans uh, up against the leans back into the corner. Um, you know, the kind of movement you would do if you were trying not to be seen from from directly out in the hallway. And uh, and then she slowly uh, creeps out and then she she like jumps around to look uh, outside the hallway uh, into the hallway. And then she comes back in and it seems like once, you know, once she does that, then she seems like she relaxes a little bit like, oh, that person isn't there or something like that. And then, um, yeah, the, the rest of the tape is, I mean, you really have to kind of watch it to really understand why it's so bizarre, but. So a couple of things on the tape. Um, the one thing that I, the first time I watched it, which was years ago, obviously, um, one thing that, that I wondered, and this is a silly question, I guess, why doesn't the door close? It seems that the door is open for an, a ridiculous amount of time. I yeah. mean, I've been on elevators before, and I don't think I've ever had that much time. So a lot of people have, have asked about that. And I mean, I, I, I don't have a definitive answer, but I, I, my, my first guess would be that she, she pressed the button, the hold the door open button, okay. and she was pressing all those buttons. And then an additional thing is that um, I, I think those doors do stay open for a while. Um, uh, John Lorden, who runs the Brain Scratch channel, he, he went there and did a kind of test on it. So yeah, the doors, the door thing is definitely, you know, eerie. I, I think there's probably a, a you know, a, an explanation for that. It is creepy how they, when they, at the end of the video, when they finally do close. And, um, but I mean, I mean, there's all kinds of anomalies with that. With right, that. Right. That's not the weirdest thing about the video, obviously, but the, uh, but it's just something that stands out right away. And so, so it seems, so she steps out, she's, she does the leaning in the corner, hiding kind of, and then she, you're right, she kind of seems to re, to relax a little bit. And then she steps out and it's almost appears as if she's, she's having a conversation with somebody. I mean, and, and yeah. there's no sound, so you don't know, but it appears if she's leaning in a little bit to talk to somebody. And that's the part where she starts doing the, the hand kind of movements and. Yeah, she's doing uh, weird things like that, or not weird, but she's doing gestures like that. Um, it does seem like she's talking to someone. It, it, it does turn out that there is a mirror on, on that hallway across from the elevator. So she could have just been seeing herself and talking to herself as, as lots of people do. Um, but, uh, and then she kind of, yeah, she, she steps to the side and she momentarily steps out of the view and it does, it's hard, it does kind of seem like she's talking to someone, but it's, it's hard, it's but hard. We don't know. We don't know. There, there's no way to know really. And, um, and then she wanders back in and she's kind of doing a, a, like a, a gesture like, oh man, what's going on? Um, and I don't know, like it, it, if you want a really great breakdown of, of the, that tape and the body language, um, there's a, the body language success uh, website has a has a great article on it that kind of breaks down every moment of it and talks about how in terms of uh, studying body language, how you can interpret some of those movements, you know, down to whether down to whether she's scared or, or happy or it, it's it's it, but unfortunately the body language analysis almost just raises more questions. But yeah, the, but yeah, she she it does walk out into the hallway, come back in. Um, and it's, I mean, I think the the most mysterious part of the tape to me is the, the time code. Well, that's that was where I was gonna go next is that there's there are pieces missing of the tape. Yeah, well, it's, there's there's a time code jump. Um, wh wh what that means uh, is, is up for interpretation, but there's, de there's definitely, I, I went through it and I can tell you almost exactly, I mean, there was a point where I could tell you exactly, I think it's around the two minute uh, 20, two minute 30 mark where the, so, okay. So the time code at the bottom obviously is extremely messed up. Um, it's, it's, you can't really tell what it says. Now, I don't know what that, what that means. It could just be a crappy, crappy system, yeah. crappy system, but 
So it basically just looks like some alien computer language or something, but you can still tell where you can tell where the microseconds are ticking. Uh, and next to it, you can tell where the second hands are ticking. And then obviously to the left of that is where the minute hand is. Okay. So there is a point where um, you, so you can tell that the minute hand changes twice in seven seconds at a certain point in the tape, the minute hand changes. And it just so happens that's right when she left the elevator. So there's no movement in the elevator. Now for anyone who knows like video editing or even just the basics of video editing, you know that if you've ever been a kid and you tried to make a tape where you wanted to make yourself magically appear, you know that you, you want to film and you want nothing to move within the frame whatsoever. And then you can stop it. And then, then you get into the frame and start it again. And it looks like you disappear, right? Okay, so that would, be, that would have been the perfect moment, second, to if someone had been editing that tape to remove someone in there, that would have been the perfect moment because she was out of the frame and the doors were, were open, nothing was moving. And seven seconds go by and the minute hand changes again. So there's definitely 100% a cut there. Now, uh, people have proffered, you know, maybe uh, it's, it could have been a surveillance system where it's movement based. So uh, if, if no one enters, if there's no movement in the frame for a certain amount of time, the surveillance automatically stops to save space. And then so when they were, when the Cecil Hotel released the tape, they just, you know, gave all the footage that was there and it naturally came packaged in a way that looked like there was a, a, a time code jump. But it's, it, it's, it's very strange and they haven't, no one has offered an explanation of that. It could be, it could be that simple of an explanation, but it could also be that uh, whoever uh, had some involvement maybe passed through the hallway at that time and, and they decided to, to cut them out of the, the video, you know? Yeah. And there's no way to know for sure until there's more information released, uh, which I'm hoping will happen at some point. Uh, but there's definitely a time code cut. There is no, there's no doubt about that. And I think if you're gonna release, I mean, it's mysterious, frankly, why they released that tape in the first place. Um, it, doesn't, it doesn't really accomplish anything. It doesn't identify her. You can't really see her that well. Um, it doesn't show anyone else. So it's not like, have you seen the person in this video who's with her? There, there's really no logistical reason to have released that tape. All it did was stick stigma or uh, stigmatize her um, and make her, you know, it, it basically created the hysteria around this case as to how she was acting. So I don't understand why you're going to release this tape and then not release any details about time code cuts, you know, related to it or anything like that. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. Well, and there's, there is a, a theory I read online. I don't remember if this is in your book or not, that somebody said it wasn't her, that she was already dead. That, uh, well, when we're going to get to the one, we're going to get to the, the, the yeah. what, what do you say, the most absurd conspiracy theory in history out of your book. Yeah. Um, but the, uh, so, so t t t talk about the ending of the video. Um, she's, she gets back in and then kind of seems relieved. And then, and then what? Yeah. So, you know, she, yeah, it gets back in. I mean, it, not a whole lot else happens, really. She's just, you know, kind of pacing around and she goes back and she tries to press some buttons again. She's obviously trying to get the elevator to close, um, you know, and I mean, she pressed a bunch of buttons to begin with that probably messed things up, but I think she pressed them in the first place because the doors weren't closing. So she just, she's confused, it seems like, about why the doors aren't closing. And so she presses them again. Um, eventually she, you know, um, leaves the frame, walks off to the left and the doors close. Now, one thing I noticed uh, that I haven't seen mentioned elsewhere is, 
So the doors, uh, the, the tape keeps running for uh, a little while longer after she leaves the frame. Um, one of the points when the door is open, um, the wall is a completely different color. So in the, in the, in the main videotape, that wall is a kind of um, a dull maroon, okay? At some point when the door is open back again, it's a bright red, okay? So that tape is either, it was either a different time of day or a different hallway, or they're just, they're, they're just splicing together a bunch of footage. It's just a, a weird tape. It's just like a weird thing to release to the public. Right, if, it, if, there's, if it's terribly inconsistent, you're not doing any favors to the investigation, unless of course, you, that's what you want. And right. you, I mean, and, and, and that's, that's a, a coming up as well, in case that's what you want is to confuse the public and, and you know, can sensationalize from what really happened. So, so the next, I mean, really the, the only thing we know after this is that 19 days later, Elise is found in the water tank. Yeah. Right. Month, yeah right. she gets off the elevator. The next thing we know that happened for sure. Yeah. So she, yeah, she went missing. Uh, the family reported her missing. They launched the investigation. Uh, yeah, she didn't check out of the hotel and she didn't, she apparently would call her parents every day. And so she wasn't checking in. So they got scared. And so they launched, you know, this investigation. And so the police did uh, two searches of, of the building. Uh, well, it turns out that they weren't, because they, they claimed that they didn't have a crime necessarily, they, they weren't going into people's rooms at the Cecil Hotel, which is, is I, I would say, probably problematic. I think when, you're, when, when a young woman goes missing, uh, and there's a tape like that. I, I, I can't imagine why there wasn't a more rigorous investigation going on except for, and I mentioned this, this was the same week that the Christopher Dorner manhunt was going on. So Christopher Dorner was an ex-cop who- Killed police officers, yeah. Yeah, went, went on a rampage, declared asymmetric war on the LAPD. And it was basically a manhunt. I mean, this was like one of the most historic weeks in LAPD history. So it stands to reason they were a little distracted. Um, and I think that definitely affected this investigation, affected, affected how much work they put into it. Um, but they did two searches of the, of the hotel uh, and, and two searches of the, the roof as well. So they, they searched the roof, but apparently did not see, uh, did not check the water tank which, which they claim would have had an open lid on it. Um, the second time they use dogs. Um, now, I don't know if these were, it was a canine unit. I don't know if they were scent tracking dogs or cadaver dogs. So I don't know at this point if they were looking for a dead body. My guess is that they were looking for a live body, which could have been maybe why the dogs didn't pick up a scent because she uh, supposedly was dead at this point. Or it's possible that that her body hadn't been put in the water tank at that point. Right. Um, but regardless, the, 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 they checked the roof twice and, and didn't find her. And that's significant because when, you're, when a body is sitting in water for that long, it, it eliminates evidence, uh, forensic evidence, uh, blood, blood, blood toxicology evidence. Um, so that's significant and, uh, you know, during this time also, I think it's something you have to consider is um, if, 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 if someone at the hotel knew that she had gone on the roof, and I don't know how they wouldn't have, um, that they were keeping an eye, they were obviously like monitoring her to a certain extent because they had moved her into a different room. I don't know how she would have gotten on the roof other than an employee letting her up there because the door, to the roof should have triggered an alarm uh, unless she went out the fire escape. But having been there and, and, and looked up at that fire escape, she didn't have her glasses on. Um, I, I really find it unlikely that she traversed this you know, precarious fire escape and climbed onto the roof. Regardless, I feel like someone at the hotel would have known or had an idea that maybe she had gone onto the roof. So you're saying, so for these two weeks while they're looking for her, I find it incomprehensible that no one at the hotel would have said, hey, maybe she's on the roof. Or if someone knew she was up there, 
why didn't they, why didn't they say that? Um, the police even say um, in one of their little side reports, um, I think it was in a deposition. Um, well, actually, no, this wasn't a deposition. This was a question I asked the uh, one of the uh, medical examiners, um, Fred Coral, who has since retired. So Fred Coral said that at one point he asked the detectives, uh, how do you think she got onto the roof? And one of the detectives said, if they think an employee let, let her up there. So if an employee let her up there, then I, I just, for life of me, I can't figure out why that employee would have gone two weeks without telling the police, oh, why, by the way, I, I let her onto the roof. Now she's missing. Let's look at the roof. Like to me, that well, that's, that's suspicious. Yeah, if the employee was part of the, the, you know, I mean, that, that, that's why, you know, I mean, I, I guess, you know, LA hotel workers probably come and go pretty quickly. Yeah. I don't, I don't know. So, so that's, that's, let's kind of get into some of these, uh, what, what we think happened. I mean, you have a, a great chapter in the book um, that is the, what do you call it? Friends and enemies of Oakham's razor. Right. Um, kind of, you know, Oakham's razor is a, is a, I'm going to paraphrase and if I'm wrong, it's kind of when you get rid of all of the, the fantastic possibilities when you're left with what you're left with. Right. I mean, is that, is that kind yeah. of, the, the maxim that is offered for it is uh, when you hear hoofbeats, think, think a horse, not a zebra. Um, so, you know, start with, start, with the, start with the explanation that requires the least amount of extrapolations or complexities. But I, I think, I mean, there's a lot of fields where Occam's razor doesn't work that way. Um, and so I don't necessarily think it's the best way to start a, an investigation. Um, well, I, I, I agree. And that's why I think your, your chapter called Friends and Enemies of it is, is it's a perfect way to look at it. I mean, some of the, some of the most, um, I don't want to say outlandish because it's no crazier than anything else, I guess. Um, but we've got, uh, there's a whole mind control that she was proud of a project that uh, with a, with, with, there, was, there was a recent um, vaccine that was LAM something or other or, yeah, no, that's like one of the weirdest synchronicities ever is that there was an outbreak of tuberculosis at this time. And the, it just turned, they sent a team of scientists, federal scientists down there to, to, to test the homeless population down there. And it just so happens to turn out that the name of, of the test they used for this strain of tuberculosis is the, the, the lamb ELISA test. Yeah, right. And it was developed at the University of British Columbia, which is where ELISA went to school. So it's, it's just like the most incredible synchronicity I've ever, I mean, I've, I've, that's one of the biggest coincidences I've ever heard. If it is. Well, and then the Alfred Crowley, you know, the, 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 one of the gods of the Thelema, the Thelema practice is, is, is L-A-M. You know, and they, they talk about the, the Alistair Crowley bit with the elevator game, and that you know that that always ties into the Alistair Crowley bit. Um, yeah. Then you've got, of course, the satanic cults and the UFOs, and those you know they throw in all the all of them. But what I want, what I wanted, I, I made, made a note to ask you this because you say this in capital letters and bold: the most absurd conspiracy theory in history. Yeah, uh, I want you to kind of kind of talk about this, and I mean, I, and I don't want to spoil the. The, your book by any means, but this is this is is worth mentioning. Yeah. So basically, there was this this uh, guy who you know I was keeping track of all the forums and threads, and um, I, I at one point I saw this guy saying that he had he was trying to get in touch with the family because he had evidence, you know he had evidence he thought he had solved the case, and uh, you know naturally I was interested in what he was going to have to say. And so we scheduled a time to talk and, um, you know, he started off sounding, you know, pretty, pretty level-headed and then gradually it, I, you know, I was asking him, you know, he was like, you know, she, she's not alone in that, in that tape. And I was like, oh, okay. Well, you mean you think there's other people in, in the hallway? And he's like, yeah, absolutely. I was like, oh, okay, well, what, what, what makes you think that? And I, I guess, his investigation tactic that he used was he just kind of zooms, zooms in on a video and he, you know, feels like he has some special tool that he's able to zoom in and look at what's really going on. And so 
what he believed was that if you zoom in closely enough, you can see that there are like levers and pulleys and straps uh, fashioned to keep her upright. And so his, his theory hypothesis was that she's already dead in the surveillance video and that there are, you know, basically she's a puppet and that they're like using these levers to, to, you know, fabricate this tape. And, you know, at that point, I obviously, I, I didn't know what to say to that. And uh, we talked, uh, somehow we ended up talking again. I think he called me and um, he actually called me again uh, a few weeks ago. <laughs> Um, and he, I guess, I guess he had read that part in the book and he was like, I know you were talking about me like, look, I'm not, I'm not mad. Um, but I just think you need to take this more seriously. And I don't know, it's part of, you know, this case brought out a lot of like really, um, extreme pathologies in people where they needed to see a pattern. Like we talked about before, um, they want to understand what's going on. And so the case is kind of like a, a like a, a Rorschach test where whatever your worldview is, uh, you're going to find that in it. So people that believe that there are uh, demons in control, um, you know, they're going to read that. And that's ultimately what he believed, um, not just demons, but also people possessed by demons. And it's, you know, that the case became that, like a lot of very strange interpretations came out. Uh, people that believed that she was a, that there was an invisibility cloak experiment going on. Um, there's just all kinds of, of crazy conspiracy theories that came out that I, I think ultimately hurt, hurt the case. And I, I, ultimately, I think these conspiracy theories are, are bad for um, citizen investigations, web, web slits, because there's no way that the police are going to take this stuff seriously and they shouldn't. And also, I don't think it's, I don't think people should be trying to contact the family, uh, families of victims with this kind of garbage. And they, they shouldn't be, uh, that's traumatizing and they shouldn't be trying to contact the detectives either because um, it, 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 it just gums up, gums up the investigation and, and makes it to where they're not going to listen to um, anyone from outside uh, in and ultimately this guy you know said yeah hey I got encountered by a detective this must have been another case he was working on where he zoomed in and uh, came up with a, an a interpretation some weird interpretation and he said yeah the detective uh, got really angry with me and threatened me and so I'm having to step down out of safety for my family I was just like yeah I mean what's gonna happen man if you're uh, so yeah, it's, it is the most absurd conspiracy theory I've, I've, I've ever heard. And what made it so strange is the guy talking to me about it sounded so normal and convinced. And um, yeah, that, that definitely became a part of this in investigation for me is, is dealing with a lot of these really um, uh, out there explanations of it. Well, as we've seen, and uh, I always try to make at least one political statement in every show. So as we've seen, um, it's not the crazies and the, 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 the people living in their mom's basements that are the wackos now. It's uh, attorneys and legislatures and, and grocery store owners. And I mean, it's, it's, uh, there's, the level of crazy is not, is, is, is not, the bar's not low on, yeah. on where they come from. So, so what uh, you talked about earlier, and this is, this is something I really want to talk about with, um, you talked earlier about how when you set out on the project, you had an idea and that you, you changed your, your theory, you changed your idea. Um, earlier or late last, early last year, I had a, a friend on the show named Jack Pachuda. And Jack is the guy who writes murder mystery parties. He's the guy that their big corporations go to. He's, he's kind of the expert on writing murder mystery parties. And um, I went to Milwaukee and took his, his uh, little workshop to start working on and to add him into my show. And, and his number one rule was, you don't start a murder mystery party knowing who the murderer is. And, and when you said that your idea changed and when you started doing research, it made me think back to when Jack said, the worst thing you can do for um, a good murder mystery is start off writing it knowing who the murderer is. And I, I just thought that was fun that you said, you know, that you kind of had an idea and then along the way you found out 
some some pieces here and some evidence and some new new discoveries that change your mind. Um, I want to kind of talk about what what happened, but I also want to tie in and, and to what you believe happened. But I also want to tie in the the, the police into this and and the the investigations. The police were were not cooperative from day one, and it could have been because of the the other things were going on. But but they it took four months to do an autopsy that by all standards should have taken an afternoon. Yeah, yeah. And, and there's there's all kinds of problems with that autopsy. Um, uh, quite frankly, like independent coroner I talked to said that there's really no good evidence that she actually drowned. Well, but, and that's one of the things I read that they there was no there was no water in her lungs that they think she was she was dumped after death. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. No, uh, it was some some fluid, but not not enough to be consistent. And there's also no water in her stomach either. Um, and and uh, they didn't do certain tests. Uh, they didn't test her sinuses. They didn't test a certain bone um, that that is usually had in your chest, bone the break. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And so there there's it. It just doesn't really seem like they did a thorough examination and I, I it took four months it took four months to not do a thorough investigation right, exactly and 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 one of those uh medical examiners uh, was also being sued at the time for for falsifying uh, in a different case falsifying an autopsy that's that's what he was being sued for now that was yeah that was an opposite case though that was a case where he was trying to say that someone was murdered and someone was suing him saying, no, this was actually an accident. So it was kind of the reverse. But as far as, you know, how I, you know, yeah, my, my changing opinion of the case, like, yeah, I went into it thinking it was probably an accident. And so I was interested in all, you know, analyzing um, how all these different conspiracies and, and theories about, about a case, uh, from my perspective, it was probably just uh, people not understanding mental illness. But as I, as I looked more into it and as I started gathering more evidence, uh, you know, speaking with independent coroner, uh, coroners and, and people, uh, you know, for example, a, uh, a bouncer who works um, at this restaurant right around the corner um, of, uh, from a Cecil Hotel, he, he told me that he spoke with an off-duty cop uh, during that investigation. And the off-duty cop had told him that they found some of Elisa's belongings in a dumpster, like in Skid Row. So now, I mean, this is, this is not corroborated evidence. This is just one person, um, but he definitely did not seem like he was pulling my chain. Like he seemed very definitive that this had been directed or this had been related to that case. So I just kept finding each new piece of evidence I, I, I find just kept changing my opinion of it, which is that uh, I, I don't know what ultimately happened, but I do feel like that there was some kind of police cover up or at the very least uh, a massively negligent investigation. Um, there's just there's just so many flaws in how they were um, studying this thing and, 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 and analyzing it. And it, there's just so many different uh, mysteries as to how they, they would not have been able to get to the body, um, how they have never, they've never offered an explanation as to how she actually climbed into the tank. Um, you know, and so, you know, I do a full breakdown of, of the different evidence, you know, but my, 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 opinion changed, which is that um, while I don't know exactly what happened, I, I do think that there was some kind of, of, of cover up. And I don't know if it was, I don't know if it started with the Cecil Hotel covering it up. You know, they, they, they were doing this huge real estate deal at the time. Um, in fact, the, the week that they announced that the body was found, it, there was also a press release that the Cecil Hotel had finally been acquired by the largest real estate firm in the world, CBRE. Uh, this was a like $100 million or more deal. Um, so this was finalized. Uh, this is a major deal for the owner at the time who became on, joined the board of the CBRE. Um, would they have wanted to conceal the discovery of the body? Um, I think 
probably the discovery of a body on the roof um, might complicate uh, a hundred million dollar real estate deal. Um, would that cause them to, you know, tell people to cover up a crime? I don't know who 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 first learned about it. Who you know when when the Santiago Lopez discovered the body. Um, who did he tell uh, the management and then who did management tell that they immediately call the police or did they call the corporate executives first and say, hey, what should we do with this? Was the lid open? That's a big question. Um, Santiago Lopez, he discovered the body. He says that the, uh, the lid was open uh, when he discovered it. But another first responder who uh, now works as a chief of police in Wisconsin um, he says the lids were closed when he showed up. So did, does that mean that Santiago, Santiago Lopez uh, looked in, saw the body, and then put the lid back over it? That's possible. Um, but why have we not heard from Santiago Lopez, uh, the guy? I mean, he, he testified in a civil deposition, and then he disappeared. And what I found out, according to his half-brother, um, who I... I my, my co-investigator talked to his half-brother and his half-brother says that Santiago, the guy who dis first discovered Lisa's body, was suddenly given a lot of money to move his family to Mexico. Um, you know, so that this is not some random person saying this. This is, San this is Santiago's half-brother who said, yeah, it was very confusing, it was very weird. Uh, it happened very quickly. All of a sudden, he was moving his family to Mexico and someone had paid for that trip. This is right after he testified in a civil deposition where he could have perjured himself. If, if he testified that the lid was open and it wasn't, that would be perjury. So this is just a, another example of strange, the, the more you dig into, or, into it, the more you find really just faulty explanations and just dust. You look, for, you look for a solid object in a case and you just end up with dust in your hands. And it's just frustrating. Well, the, I mean, the, the, the hotel didn't, I mean, they wouldn't have known. The police wouldn't have known. The, the reason they discovered the body, correct, is that res, people say guests of the hotel were complaining oh, about right. the yeah. smell and the color and the taste of the water. Yeah. Yeah, I can't believe we I can't believe this is the first we're mentioning this because it's such a, a normal part of the case. But yeah, the the, the hotel had uh, all the guests or a lot of the guests were complaining because there was dark water, basically uh, dark sediment was turning up in the water, um, you know, which was a, and, and, and so eventually enough people complained that eventually Santia, uh, Santia, I think it was San Diego, no, it was uh, Tovar. Uh, went out there and, and checked, and that's when they found the body. Um, so that's kind of a, a, a grisly um, a grisly aspect of the case there. That... So is there any uh, idea of how long, do they believe she was in the water for 19 days? Or do, what are the, what are the uh, is there any thought about how long she was in there? I mean, based on, on how far she had deteriorated? And I mean, because I imagine this is, this is January, right? It's January in Los Angeles. So it's not the, the summer, but it's still not like January in Northern Colorado. It's still going to be warm up there. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I don't, I don't think that the autopsy ever directly stated how long she had been in, in the water. Um, but that's a good question because yeah, it's, it's definitely relevant. How long was that body in the water? Um, or was it, was it in there the whole time? or was it placed there later? Um, based upon the decomposition and the marbling, they, they, they're not able to say, the, the medical examiner wasn't able to say like for sure, uh, you know, how long, you know, how long she was in there. Um, and she was completely nude and her, her clothing was in there with her, correct? Yeah, yeah, totally nude. And yeah, she, uh, so I guess the, the implication, according to the police narrative, is that she went up onto this, you know, pitch black roof by herself, um, climbed uh, up onto this platform, climbed a ladder up onto a dark metal object that I don't frankly know how she would have known that that was a water tank. 
uh, and climbed up there, took her clothes off, climbed into this tank. And put her, brought her clothes with her. Into brought her the yeah, brought her clothes with her and then realized that she couldn't get out, which has always been one of the more chilling thoughts for me is if that is how it went down. Um, once she got in there, realizing that she wasn't gonna be able to get out, uh, that is, is pretty horrifying. But yeah, I don't, I mean, and again, this goes back to the police using mental illness as a, as a, as a, as a you know, an explanation for this. Um, and, and, you know, the release of the tape was, was the release of the tape, uh, you know, something that backed up their explanation. Like, oh, look, she's acting strange here. This, this, is why, uh, this is why we're saying that this was an accident based on bipolar. Um, and yeah, I, 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 it's, it's very hard to imagine her climbing in there, but it's definitely, it's definitely possible, I guess. Um, and this was, so Santiago is the, uh, the one that's referred to as the, the security guard, correct? That, 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 uh, that- No, 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 no. No, Santiago is just the maintenance worker. Okay, so there's a, there's also a story, some sort of conspiracy about a security guard that disappeared, correct? Yeah, I haven't heard about a security guard disappearing. What, I, what I've heard is, a, uh, is, is multiple reports of a security guard that was creeping women out. That, maybe that's where I got, maybe I'm, I'm mixing, yeah. melding the stories, yeah. Yeah, but just, yeah, there's, there's several stories. I mean, I had uh, a, a, one woman who like directly emailed me saying that, she had stayed there and uh, said that she she for sure felt like this, there was a security guard that was sizing her up and and giving her a very predatory look. And so, yeah, I, I don't know if if maybe someone spooked Elisa like that, and or maybe the security guard said, "Hey, let me let me give you a tour. Uh, let me show you the roof." Um, yeah, I, I, I desperately wish I, I knew. And, uh, you know, I'm, you know, on, on a break from the case now, but I, I think, you know, in the future, I, I would imagine I'm going to return to this and I, I'm still, uh, you know, you know, we shot half of the documentary and now we're, you know, out of funds. And I, it just drives me nuts because I, I want to get back in to, the, to that building, and that's another problem right now is the building is, is closed right now, and it's very difficult to, to get in there. But um, yeah, well, I'll, I'll get into an update on the film in, in a minute, but yeah, I... So they, they ruled that in, in this four month long uh, autopsy, they ruled that there was no drugs or alcohol in her system, but that could have been deteriorated by the water, correct? Yeah. They ruled that there was no physical trauma or sexual abuse, Correct. Yes, but they also note that there was uh, some uh, anal trauma, basically. Oh. Uh, but they 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 they, dis they explain that as a, a process of, of uh, decomposition gases. Okay. Uh, but uh, another the other uh, coroner I talked to said that that could be evidence of an assault. So. It depends who you talk to, but yeah, officially the autopsy said there was no assault. And it's, so it has been ruled an accident and is the case, the case is closed in the, in, in the Los Angeles Police Department, correct? Yeah, the case is closed. They, they changed the autopsy from undetermined to accident. And uh, so this, this, the only, the only evidence, the only research being done on this is, is by, by investigative reporters and, and, and people like you, correct? There's no, there's no active index investigation in the, in the LAPD on this right now. No, there's not. What there. would it take? I mean, what, what do you think it would take to, uh, to, to reopen the case or to, I mean, I, I imagine that's, that's really what your, your goal is, is to kind of find some, some, for lack of a better term, some justice or some closure for the, for Alicia, Alisa and her family. To, sure. to, is, and so what, I mean, it's, it's, it's going to take a silver platter. It sounds like for the LAPD to, to, yeah, I don't. I don't think they have any intention of revisiting the case. I, I think all of the uh, media hoopla and, and and stuff that went on over it, I think, further hardened them to not wanting to talk about the case. Uh, but not, no one, 
but we'll find out. I mean, I think what it's going to take is is someone who either worked there um, or, or has inside knowledge uh, coming out and talking about it. And, and you know, to be clear, there, there could be nothing to talk about. It could be like, like they said, um, it just it just seems like there's a lot of missing pieces. And um, I, I, I think, you know, there's this there's this new series coming out about it. And I think that they I think they got some what I've heard is they got some interviews with with people a little bit closer to the case. So I'm very excited to see whether, you know, whether they're going to shed any light on what happened or it could have just been a case of just uh, an absurd, tragic accident. And then uh, the police just kind of uh, not doing a very good job of, of explaining it or providing answers that that's possible too, but uh, you know, uh, yeah, I, 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 I think the case should be re-looked at. I mean, I think, I think at the very least, like the California attorney general should, you know, uh, take a look at that hotel, um, especially if they're going to re reopen it with a bar and a pool on the roof. I think they need to look at, look at the history of the place. They need to come to some kind of reckoning of past managers who, uh, put up with predatory em employees, pla uh, past employees who assaulted women there. They need uh, to do a full audit of, of what's going on in there and, and, and so that it won't happen again. And then, yeah, look at what happened on that night. How did an employee, how did this guest get on the roof and, and end up naked and dead inside of a tank? Um, how was she allowed to get up there? Um, the, the civil case by the family ultimately was rejected, um, which was, you know, made it to where the hotel didn't have any blame for her getting up there. Well, the, the family's not the only one that launched a case against the hotel. Several of the guests did as, as well, correct? Yeah, yeah. There was a family from, uh, I believe, Great Britain that did a civil lawsuit. And we never heard the resolution of that. My guess is they settled out of court. Uh, about that but yeah they, they didn't respond to me when I tried to talk to them um, so my guess is that they settled out of court and and uh, agreed not to, to discuss it publicly so Lisa's family their their lawsuit against the the hotel and the the ownership of the hotel was negligence or was it negligence resulting in debt what was their what was their their claim uh, it just yeah it was it was some kind of yeah negligence basically that uh, the, the tank wasn't secured enough that basically they, they, their, their claim was that, uh, it shouldn't have been possible for Elisa to get up to the roof and climb into the water tank. Um, and it that, started, right. It got dismissed before it even reached. That's the shame of it is that the judge threw it out before we even got to, uh, a discovery phase, which is really just horrible because the, I was very looking forward to that because it meant that the invest it meant that the detectives and the police were going to have to provide a bunch of evidence. It, it meant that we were going to learn a lot more about about what went on. But because the judge threw it out, um, it basically allowed the police to just seal up the case again. So you you mentioned that Santiago testified in a civil case. What was his civil case where he testified? Well, that it, it was the 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 case. I mean. Before, okay, the preliminaries on that. Well, yeah, it was just, yeah, civil, civil deposition. Um, uh, yeah, it was just basically in writing and, and him and the manager and the chief engineer all just basically have the same story. And, uh, you know, not a lot of information came out from that. Well, if you guys have any questions, I've kept Jake for 40 minutes longer than I told him I was going to. So, so uh, if you guys have any questions, chime in here. Um, we've got a few people that are saying that, you know, without glasses that says somebody who wears glasses, there's no way they could have navigated that at night. Um, some other people are saying that, uh, you know, they couldn't believe it was four months that it took four months. So um, let's, let's talk a little bit about the Kickstarter and um, the, the trials and tribulations of, of doing a Kickstarter. I, I, I know that they're, they're way more work than anybody ever thinks they're getting into. And yeah. And it's, it's a, it's a sore spot for me because I, I, it's, you know, it's been like, you know, over three years, maybe even more. And um, I, I definitely like feel immense guilt that I have not 
produce a film on it. Um, you know, the thing about a Kickstarter is it, it's called Kickstarter for a reason. It's supposed to kickstart a project. Um, with a film, it's, it's, you know, after the, um, you know, the deductions taken by um, Kickstarter and taxes, you know, we ended up with about, you know, $20,000, which is a good chunk to get started. And it definitely helped me, you know, definitely helped launch this investigation. And it helped us shoot about, you know, 40 to 50% of the footage we feel like we would need. Um, and, you know, to, to summarize it pretty, I mean, we basically got screwed a couple times with, with, with people, um, you know, acting like they were going to help, you know, fund. I mean, we weren't asking for a lot, but we, we did need some additional money um, to, to finish this thing, um, to make it broadcast ready and everything. And it just hasn't come together. And so in the meantime, I wrote this book and, you know, I hope, I hope our, you know, you were one of our Kickstarter supporters and I appreciate that. And so basically where we're at with the Kickstarter is we, there is a, a production company, um, show of force who is, who we've been working with and talking with and they, they want to, they want to produce a, 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 they want, basically they want to take over our, our production and help us, um, probably shouldn't have used their name, but oh well. Um, and it was about to happen. We were literally about to sign uh, something. Uh, there was no money involved. They were just going to license the book to try and make a series on it. And they were going to absorb our footage and, and, you know, proceed from there. And then basically that week, they, they found out that uh, Netflix was doing a series on it. Uh, director Joe Berlinger, who's, who's done, I think he did the Blair Witch sequel and, um, uh, you know, someone with a lot more bona fides than, than us um, came in and w the whole thing is weird. I don't, I mean, we, we pitched this thing to Netflix and they, they turned us down. So I don't really understand how all of a sudden Netflix is now producing this other guy's series who, you know, look, you know, studied our Kickstarter and, and read my book and, and, you know, is, I was part of a pitch to uh, Netflix on a show that they uh, that, that they eventually uh, released it. They they held it for a little while, and then they eventually released it because um, it it was too smart for Netflix audience. Is is kind of what the the vibe they said it was. You know, they want you know right now the reality world, the reality show world is um, duck duck hunters or alligator hunters or that kind of garbage. But well, let's uh, let's let's see what we can do, and and uh, if you ever need any help, you know I've got some viewers out there that would love to see it completed. So, so yeah, it's if you ever if you start anything back up, reach out and uh, and we'll gladly put you put you back on and, and try to get you some uh, some get you know help you get this done. I also would like to we talked a little bit about this before. Um, I'd love to invite you down to New Orleans sometime and uh, and come do a book signing down there, and we'd love to host you at the restaurant for sure. Um, and I, I talked about earlier, I haven't been on the air since the restaurant opened. I opened a restaurant in New Orleans with my, my dear friend, Marita Crandall, who has been on the show with me before. Um, and we opened it on New Year's Day and to huge success. It's been, it's been more successful than I, than I ever would have thought. And so I'm going to be down there. Um, let me go through these real quick before we wrap up. I'll be down there on, uh, for Valentine's Day and which two days later is Mardi Gras. Valentine's Day is the 126th anniversary of the death of Josie Arlington, who was the big madam in Storyville. She was kind of the madam for Storyville. So we're going to do a little Storyville seance called Blue Book. Um, 12 people includes dinner. So uh, you can you can find out information on that on the Mystery Collection Facebook page. Um, and then I'll post the, the schedule for the next shows coming up. But so Jake, what do you have uh, coming up? We'll kind of wrap up with what you, you've got working on, what you've been working on during the downtime. I know you said you helped your folks out down in Albuquerque for a while, but what, uh, what are some of the things you've done to kind of keep, keep a sense of normal, you know, during, right. during the. Yeah. Great, crazy times. And yeah, I mean, um, by the way, congratulations on, on your restaurant. It's awesome. And I would definitely love to, I would love to come down there and do uh, a, 
you know, do an event and, and whatnot. And yeah, I, one of the things I'm doing. Tell me when it works, because I know a guy that can make it happen. Okay. So you, you tell me when it works for you, when things start opening up and we right. can fill the front. Yeah, let me know. We'll, we'll do that for sure. And um, yeah, I mean, one of the things I'm doing is uh, uh, mail, mail, trying to mail out all these books to people that supported our, our Kickstarter. And it's, um, so yeah, if, 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 if you are a Kickstarter supporter, uh, first of all, know that at some point we are going to finish this thing. I promise. It's I don't, I don't know when it's going to happen, but uh, maybe we'll, maybe we'll be the ones who end up stumbling upon the piece of evidence that reopens the case and go from there. But um, so, yeah, hopefully this maybe this maybe this Netflix series will bring out bring out those people. Right. You know, this Netflix people will say, "Oh, I know a little bit more about this than than I." Yeah, it's possible. Yeah, hopefully. But yeah, in the meantime, I've, I've been, you know, uh, uh, you know, wrapping things up with with the book, sending that out. I'm still, still, you know, speaking with a production company about, you know, how we can turn this into a series. Also looking into, like I told you, the West Mesa uh, case in Albuquerque. Um, that's a, a serial killer uh, in Albuquerque's first serial killer that I've been looking into it's a very creepy disturbing case and yeah uh, just yeah you know it's crazy times uh it's it's good to stay busy working on things i'm just trying to keep my mind limber with with looking at new cases and keeping up with old ones and uh yeah it, the, these true crime cases are, are are strange like you can hit dead ends and you know there's there's people that you know it can it there's people that have made great true crime documentaries and it's taken them 10 years to get all the information they need. And I, I don't think it's gonna take that long for us, but uh, it's obviously taken a little while, but yeah, I'm still working on it and I'm, I'm not gonna give up. So I, I, I appreciate you having me on here and uh, talking about this. We just had a recent case um, here in, in Greeley, Colorado, uh, in Northern Colorado of a girl that disappeared in the late 80s and she was 14, right before Christmas, she disappeared. And um, they just they just solved it. They just recently solved it. And they've, they've arrested a guy and they found the body and it's been, I mean, it's been 35 years. And it's been every year, the, the local paper runs an article and every year it's it's still, you know, I had, I know people that lived in the neighborhood. I mean, she, she was about my age and when it happened. And um, it's been one of those things that, that, you know, and I think with, with you looking into this one in Oklahoma and this one in Albuquerque, um, there are, those aren't maybe as cessation, sensational as, as Elisa or some of the other big unsolved, but those mean something to those communities. Right. I mean, they, they absolutely mean something to those communities. This Janelle Matthews that, that disappeared here, she still has family around. And, and, you know, it brought some closure, not only to her, but it brought some closure to the community, to people that were, she, she disappeared after her Christmas choir concert at her school. Oh, and so there were people that saw her and gave her a hug and said, hey, Merry Christmas, you know, and then she disappeared and it brought, I mean, as terrible as it was, but they've arrested a man for a murder and um, they, they, it brings some closure. So I think you're doing, you're doing what, what you're doing is, is very entertaining and very, you know, uh, a, a huge addition to pop culture, but I also think that there's a an underlying seriousness to it that is you you know the 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 strive for 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 truth and and I said it earlier and it sounds silly but to bring some justice to people like Elisa I think that's very respectable and I, I'm I'm a fan of the uh, the the, the uh, to, to to go to that quote the book is not written like I I love true crime I love it the book is not written like most true crime books. It's, it's uh, I would absolutely recommend this book. And, and uh, we have a question. Can we order the book? Go to Amazon. It's on Amazon. You can get it in Kindle or um, hardcover or uh, audiobook as well. It's on Kindle uh, or it's on uh, uh, Audible, I believe. Yeah, I think you can get, I mean, I think there's a lot of independent bookstores that. Right, uh, right. Yeah. 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 And, and, and they, they, yeah, I mean, everyone knows like independent bookstores probably, probably uh, are, are pretty desperate right now. Like I know here in Portland, I know that Powell's bookstore has it. Um, but yeah, the, like you can get it all the main ways. It's, it's, um, but yeah, if, 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 if you order it and. Uh, Bring it to New Orleans and come down and buy Jake a drink and he'll sign it. <laughs> yeah, so the, uh, you know, I went to Powell several years ago and they have that upstairs uh, I'm, I'm a book nerd. I'm a huge book nerd. And they have that controlled temperature, humidity controlled room for the rare books. 
And we, uh, the guy was out that day because they have one employee and he wasn't, so we couldn't go in it. And we had to catch a plane later that afternoon. So I didn't get to go to that, but uh, I'll make it back sometime. I'm a, I'm a Chuck Palahniuk fan as well. So I, I, I hear, I hear about Portland quite a bit from, from that. So, um, so Jake, anything, anything else you want to, you want to plug? Be, uh, they got the ghost mysteries or I'm sorry, the ghost diaries. Yeah. Um, no, I, I think, you know, yeah. Uh, yeah. Keep an eye on the ghost diaries and, uh, yeah, more to come. Good, good stuff. Good stuff will be coming down the pipeline. All right. Well, Jake, you are one of the first people I've had on this this little silly program that I started just to keep my creative juices flowing. That I didn't have a personal friendship or with later uh, or earlier. But uh, I think now um, I, I you're I'm calling you my friend. You're my friend. Absolutely. Now. So, oh, I, I appreciate you having me on, man. And absolutely. And anytime you're in this way, let's let's uh, let's try to hook up in the future. I'll come out to Portland, or you come to Colorado or New Orleans, and we'll uh, we'll sit down and, and solve some solve some of the mysteries of the world. How's that sound? It will happen, buddy. Thank you. So, so guys, thanks. Uh, I'll be back on uh, I'm uh, two weeks. I won't be here next weekend, but two weeks will be uh, Jen and Kim from the Booze B O O S and Bourbon Podcast. And it will probably be pretty sloppy because we had to cancel with them earlier. And I sent them four bottles from um, 477 Distilling here in town. And uh, we're, we're going to probably drink a lot of whiskey on that show. So uh, drink whiskey and talk about ghosts. And then, of course, coming up in February, I have Bobby Liebling. I don't know if you know this story. Um, uh, the band Pentagram. Have you ever heard of the band Pentagram? No, I haven't. There's a really great documentary called The Last Day Here on, and it's on, it's on uh, uh, YouTube and it's about Bobby Liebling and um, his, his struggle with, with, with mental illness, his struggle with drug addiction and they would have been, and I, I have no problem saying this and I don't think people that know will doubt, will disagree with me. They would have been the American version of Black Sabbath. They absolutely would have been as big as Black Sabbath. Wow. And I watched this documentary. I went through this loop of watching metal and black metal documentaries about the, you know, the Lords of Chaos and all that stuff over in Norway. And this one popped up. So I watched it and I reached out. I, I told my buddy Bill to watch it. He watched it. And I said, I'm going to call Bobby Liebling. And I, so I looked him up online, found him. And that night I'm on the phone with him. So he's, he's, uh, he hasn't done many of these. So he'll be on in February. So stay tuned for that one. So guys, um, Stay safe and, uh, and have fun. And um, as I close every show with uh, the best advice I can have is uh, listen to Bill Hicks. Thanks, guys. Jake, thanks a ton. Take care, bud. Thank you, man.